But here's the question. Presidential power. Has the executive branch gone too far? That's the question we're debating. Now, when I practice in moot court sessions before the Supreme Court of the United States, no matter what the case is, they always tell you there's just two answers. It's either yes or no. So here's the question. Presidential power. Has the executive branch gone too far? Yes. <laughs> now, I say yes for a couple of reasons. I think you can challenge policies of a president and still have respect for the office of the president. I think that's what our liberty is all about. But I don't think you can say that the president just gets a pass because the president, and I'm not talking about this particular president or any president, the president is not a monarch. He's elected office. So, David, what you talk about gridlock, I say that's the, that's the process we live in. That's the republic in which our founders envisioned that there would be this robust, incredible debate on issues that matter. The presidency is not something you get to keep. Benjamin Disraeli, the great prime minister of England, said when he became prime minister and wrote a letter to a friend of his, he said, I reached the top of the greasy pole. <laughs> and I think that's a good way to view any elected office. You don't get to hold on to it. But you have to be very careful on how that power is exercised. And when we get into our discussion in a little bit, I'm going to ask some questions, and I'm sure the other panelists will, about the nature of the presidential power. Can the president, for instance, to give you a little preview, can the president say a law that gets passed by Congress, decided to be constitutional by the Supreme Court of the United States, against some of our objections, and then decides not to enforce a particular part of it? Can the president pick and choose what aspects of a law he gets to enforce. Did we have a real vote on or a proposed vote on Syria because the president wanted to be, bring Congress in or was it because in foreign diplomacy the Russians proposed a solution, which is a scary thought in my mind to begin with. <laughs> but I think those are the questions we have to be asking ourselves. Now in full disclosure I represent uh, John Boehner before the Supreme Court of the United States in those recess appointment cases. And it's a very technical issue. I'm not going to bore you with the facts. But what's significant about these recess appointment is not just the nature of how it impacts the political process regarding appointments to the cabinet or official positions, but also does the president get to decide when the speaker thinks there should be recess? Or is that something Congress gets to decide? And the Constitution is pretty clear about that. So we're up at the Supreme Court of the United States on that one. Let me close with this. You're going to hear a lot in the next hour and a few minutes. But always remember this. We live in the greatest country in the world. We get to have this kind of discussion. Nobody's getting arrested. <laughs> no one's getting penalized. No one's going to be charged, except if you're targeted by the Internal Revenue Service. <laughs> Now, I like rebuttal arguments. It's my favorite part of a case. In our system, we get to relitigate. It doesn't mean we don't respect an institution or we don't respect an office, but we get to relitigate. We have elections every two years for the members of the House of Representatives, senators every six, presidents every four. But I think there is part of this that we need to focus on for a moment, and that's where I made the statement that I have, like David, I have hope. Uh, you know, elections don't always go the way you want them to go. Supreme Court cases don't always go the way you want them to go. But I can't think of another country I'd rather be in than this one. And I take that rather personally. And I'm going to take these next few minutes to, to lay out a little bit of the personal side of this. Because I think we can get lost in the policy discussions and the debates and, 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 the, and the angst, as the word was used, uh, that takes place in Washington, D.C. But when my grandfather came to the United States through Ellis Island in 1914, fleeing Russia because of religious persecution. He was a fruit peddler in Brooklyn, New York. I think he had a lot of hope. Had so much hope that his grandson, the grandson of the fruit peddler, gets to argue cases at the Supreme Court of the United States. So I do, I'll admit it, Mr. Speaker, I do defer to the courts. Because as an officer of the court, 
That's the oath I take. Your oath was different as speaker. In the end, all of our job is to defend and protect the integrity of the United States and our constitutional republic. You know, when, when people call me and say I'm really upset about what the president's done on a particular issue, I, I mean, I make the statement, it's not flippant. Elections have consequences. And that also means when people that are really principled and really want to engage the issue and take strong and even strident stands, that's why my grandfather came to the United States. And I suspect that most of you have a pretty similar story in your history, in your family. So I want to leave you with this hope. Two things. Number one, we don't have a country to flee to. This is our country. We've been blessed to be here. And number two, with all the tumult and all the issues and all the consternation and the arguing and the fighting and the gridlock and the shutdowns, Divine providence plays a role in this country. I really believe that. I don't think we're the only country in the world, by the way, that's free. But I think we have been given a unique opportunity. We can't squander it. But we also don't surrender it. And that means you fight for freedom, and you fight for principles, and you really don't let groups get targeted because they use the word liberty. And patriot. But you know what, at the end of the day, and I'm handling this IRS case, at the end of the day, it's not about the IRS. It's about freedom. And will we be intimidated into silence? Or will we get on a boat, as my grandfather did, sail past that Statue of Liberty, wait 15 years to become a United States citizen, work in a fruit stand, and maybe it's your grandson or great-grandson that ends up serving that office where these gentlemen have served the President of the United States. Because everybody here has that spark. We have that, we have that divine opportunity. Let's not squander it. Thank you very much.